be seated. Grace and peace to you from Christ, the one who draws all people to himself. Today's lesson is a little prelude, a little teaser, uh, or what is the new word for that? Uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> for Holy Week. Oh, you get the cross here today. And you get Jesus talking about the cross and what the cross means. And it's vital for us because next week is the beginning of Holy Week, Palm Sunday. Which, by the way, now I just remember, bring your jackets. <laughs> no, it's, uh, this is moving us into the conclusion of Lent, Holy Week, Good Friday, Monday, Thursday, Holy Saturday, and eventually Easter. And it starts very simple. Some foreigners, not the Jewish followers of Jesus, who were the first. You know, the first ones. We were the first. No, Greeks. Gentiles. We don't know how many. I drew two on there for the kids. Some Greeks, some Gentiles. Yes, yes, some uncircumcised people came to see Jesus. Now, this is a chance for me to, as preachers like to do on occasion, too much, but I'll do it. That word see is not like you might think the, the soft form of see. Like we'd like to see Jesus, like maybe from behind a tree, we'd like to see what his face looks like or the color of his hair or his beard or something you know, shallow like that. In Greek, there are these strong nuances of the word see. No, they're not wanting to get a glimpse of his face or his robe. They want to know him better. That's the strength of this word. In fact, uh, a stronger nuance, and it could be this one, is they want to even, yes, live with him, become his disciples, his followers, like those Jewish ones. But they knew, because this was an old fight, in the old days, there were the Jews, the chosen ones, and then there were those others, the heathen, the Gentiles, with all their ideas and so on. And they come to Philip. And uh, Philip, you know, he, he becomes the magnet. They respectfully come to him and say, we like to know your master, your mentor, this Jesus. Either they had heard about him, you know, there was these great crowds that Jesus drew to himself. J Jesus has a drawing power all the way through the New Testament. He's always drawing people to him, and they are drawn to him either by love and excitement or sometimes conflicted. But he's always drawing people to himself, see? And Philip, I, and now this is just for free. This is my little idea about what happened. It may not be right. I'm going to say it anyway. Why did they come to Philip, and why did Philip go see Andrew? Because this was a major move in the Bible, a major move in the life of the early church, which started with 12, you know, disciples, then there were 70, then there were 170, you know how the scripture tells the story. And I think, for my money, Philip was wondering, the Gentiles... Uh, we have a nice little relationship with our master. It's cozy. Are we going to extend this to more people who look different, who don't even speak Hebrew, probably uncircumcised? Uh, I'm making all this up now, but I think it might be close. And so he, he doesn't want to take the responsibility of figuring this out by himself. He calls Andrew. Let's talk about this. Aren't we having fun by ourselves? in our parochial little gang. And, uh, well, they don't come up with an answer, so they go to Jesus and ask him. And Jesus gives an answer, Jesus style. It's not yes or no. <laughs> you, you know that Jesus is a character. He's always talking in metaphor. He's always going deep. And it's that deep stuff that he says that has always both enlightened me and haunted me. Uh, Jesus, one of them says, Andrew or Philip, we don't know. These Gentiles, these Greeks, they want to know you. They want to learn from you. They, 
uh, Jesus, I think they actually want to become your disciples like us. What do you think? And what does Jesus say? <laughs> He's crazy, beautiful, strong. Unless a grain of wheat, what? Dies and goes into the ground. It remains just a what? A single grain. You see where this is going? But if it dies, oh, I forgot. What does it bear? Much fruit. Every farmer, every gardener knows this. My grandpa from Minnesota was a farmer. He knew this. All farmers know it. You've got to die to have life. And I'm betting that part of what Andrew and Philip were learning is that they had to die to the parochialism. Because Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That includes those uncircumcised Greeks who had heard about Jesus and wanted to do more than get a glimpse of him. See, that's what I think for my money. All right, he just says more. <laughs> he st still doesn't answer yes or no. He's giving them something, some fodder, some uh, feed to think on, to reflect on, to take into their heart. He says uh, this marvelous phrase, those who love their life in this world will lose it, but those who hate their life in this world will gain it. Now, here again, <laughs> just so you know, I went to seminary. Hate here... <laughs> hate here is not emotional hate. Like, you know, people say, oh, I hate that person. That's not what it means. It is a typical Jewish idiom that is a contrast between two things that the author of the words wants to make so clear that he or she uses hyperbole, exaggeration. You, in comparison with the old life, with Caesar, with the emperor, with the powers that be that destroy people in order to gain for their own ego's sake, if you hate that life, then you'll love the new life. It's a comparison. Um, and that's powerful words. Why does he say that? And then he has, says one more thing, that, and this is very instructive, not only for those Greeks and for Andrew and Philip, but for us. Um, Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. Jesus is giving good, fair warning. The life he's bringing, and these Greeks heard about it, all this unconditional love, which they were drawn to. But he says, just a warning. Where I am, my servants will be also. And he goes on to say, my hour has come. For what? <laughs> The Christian life is a dying to the old, a hating, yes, a hating of the principles of hatred that are rampant in this world. And we know it all too well. But it is a new loving of the new life. But he wants people to know this. And by the way, it could bring hardship, even death. Um, we all know the news that broke you know, about Alexei Navani. Uh, killed almost exactly a month ago in a Siberian prison camp, a work camp, which reminds me of Marion. <laughs> I can hardly tell the story, and so I won't. It'll be a sermon for another time, but I'll just tease you again. Uh, I met this Marion who was Russian uh, in Kondopoga, a little community north of Kondopoga called Deravenka. And five of us went into her house, little tiny village, um, nothing there but some houses. It looked like something from Fiddler on the Roof, these little huts. And she wanted to meet the American bishop. She wanted the group to come to her house. She had tea. Her house was a building with sheep in it and chickens in it and everything else. Uh, very, very poor. And she came and she was going to kiss my hand. I said, no. <laughs> but I gave her a hug. Anyway, she told me about her husband going to a Siberian work prison camp and dying there, and her son. And then she went to her uh, cupboard and picked out an old, very dusty and very blotchy picture of her husband, and she kissed it and made the sign of the cross. She said, in Russian, I had a translator, Bishop, we are Lutheran. 
we remember Christ's words above all others. I'll never forget that. It was translated to me. I just, I was crying. It was so powerful. Well, Alexei Navalny, well, we know that he was a very famous uh, crusader for justice and peace in Russia and spoke out against Putin regularly and was poisoned. He was supposed to be dead three years ago in 2021, but a month ago he was, he was killed. And Putin hated him so much he would never even speak his name in public. Well, everybody knew who he was talking about. But what many people don't know is that Navalny had become a Christian. And I think that what he did is exactly what Jesus is talking about to those would-be disciples, the Greeks. Um, it's clear Navalny expected to die. And he went anyway. He went back to Russia after being a second time to continue working. And his wife, if you haven't seen the movie yet, I haven't seen it, the documentary. Uh, it's called, uh, it's on CNN and HBO, simply a, doc a documentary called Navalny. I'm going to see it. I couldn't see it when I was up in Minnesota off the grid. There was no, uh, there was no, it was way up north. <laughs> no, Navalny chose to follow Christ. And it brought him the greatest of hardships, didn't it? And yet he knew the Christian story. He knew the Christ story. He knew what Jesus is talking about today. Let me see that again. What does it say? I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Do not think for a second that what Navalny has done is not bearing fruit. Well, maybe not in the time frame we would like, but this is a mystery of grace, the mystery of love, the mystery of Christ. It happens and it will continue to happen. Oh, it goes on. Those who love this life the way it is will lose it. Those who hate their life in this world the way it is will gain it, will keep it for eternal life. Navalny knew this as a Christian, and he went anyway. Oh, one more thing. Whoever serves me will follow me, and where I am, my servant will be also. And this applies to us. Now, this is a bold case of following Jesus, and every context is different. But we have been chosen to not only feel the joy of the Christian life, but to live it fully, which means living for other people. Uh, for all other people. Because the very last verse says it all. It sums up the whole thing. And I, when I am lifted up from this earth, will draw all people to myself. This is a way to begin to think about Holy Week. To begin to think of the holy mystery, which I told you last time, in the words of the poet Auden, is beyond all knowing and liking. It is a power unto salvation for the whole world. No exceptions. It's so powerful I can hardly speak it. I'm still so enthralled by the upside-down, tipsy-turvy kingdom, reign of God's unconditional love for all people. Um, what happens on the cross? He gives us a little answer. Jesus does. Destroy death, sin, and evil forever. It'll be nailed with Jesus to the cross and done away with. And secondly, to draw everyone to himself. Christian, think on these holy mysteries. Let it bother you. It's okay. Let it give you joy. It's marvelous. It's a both and, see? And know that your efforts are never perfect, but, and here it comes, sin boldly. <laughs> That's a Luther phrase, one of his great contributions to the church Catholic. He said, or he said it often, sin bravely, knowing that all of our efforts are never as good as Jesus. It's all right, we're human. Sin anyway. Boldly, know that part of what you do for others still has a little taint of what's in it for me. That's what Luther's saying. I'm going to talk about that next week at the uh, forum, Palm Sunday. 
Um, we, we have this selfish gene in us. And I know we'd like to say, we really don't. But you know what? Get over yourself. <laughs> we really do. And God loves sinners. Like me. Like you. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow is not yet come. Live into the wonder of the hardship and the joy of following Jesus today. Amen.